Amen. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Psalm 63 this morning? Psalm 63. We're going to be looking at the first eight verses. You know, I, I really, as I began to pray and, and let the Holy Spirit begin to lead me on what to share with you on Father's Day, I thought, well, surely the Lord would lead me to a message where I could share and challenge dads about how important it is to be there for their children. I read a report from Lifeway that said about 51% across our nation, the fathers have abandoned their children. That's alarming. I thought surely the Lord would lead me to share something about that or how, how important it is to, to model for your children. How important it is to set that example. And then, as I began to pray, the Lord led me to Psalm 63. About having a real desire for God. And then it hit me. If we're pursuing God, if we're pursuing that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, indeed if you have that relationship, then everything about fatherhood begins to fall into place. You know, sometimes we experience some setbacks in our life, and you can kind of expect to use the analogy bad weather to come along. We make the best plans we can, not knowing what really lies ahead. King David found himself in that kind of situation. He faced a variety of bitter disappointments and from time to time the prophet Samuel would announce that he would be king and that he would face some personal, physical and even political dangers. Now as king things begin not to look so good because his own son Absalom began to conspire against him and rebel against him. Can you imagine your own son rebelling against you? But yet that's exactly what was happening. Sometimes, and I'm sure some of you could testify, we have rebellious children for a number of reasons. And, and David began to, to, to flee for his life and he found himself in a desert. I don't think that was accidental and he probably wrote this psalm from there because God maybe had placed him there to reveal something about his own spiritual condition. He was looking around. It was a very dry. Sometimes if we're not careful, we can find ourselves spiritually dry. This is not just for dads, even though this is Father's Day. This is for absolutely everyone. But we can find ourselves in that place. We, we can find ourselves in a very parched, hardened, dry place spiritually. And we need to be refreshed and renewed in the things of the Lord. And, and so out of that, David writes this psalm. And would you stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word this morning? And he cries out, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there's no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. Someone asked me one time several years ago, is there any place in the Bible that, that somehow lets you know that it's all right to raise your hands in praise? Well, here's you one of many. I will lift my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as, as, as with the fat and the goodness, the moral and the fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate 
on you in the night watches. Because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. Father, I pray this morning there might be some deads that are struggling. There might be others that are struggling today. And they feel spiritually dry, spiritually parched, desiring something much more than what they're experiencing. And I pray today, Lord, I pray that if there's someone here that does not know you, that the day would be the day of salvation. I, I pray, Father, this morning that if there's someone that feels that, that spiritual dryness today, that their, their souls will be renewed, refreshed. And they'll have a, a, a fresh desire for you like they've never had before. I pray now that you'll lead us in all that's said and done. May you receive the glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In the first three verses, we see David begins to desire God. I tell you, when throughout God's word, when, when men and women who love the Lord face difficult days, they respond in, in many different ways. And it tells us something about where our relationship is with the Lord. If our hearts are truly lined up with his heart. You know, sometimes instead of just sitting and worrying, and feeling as if there's, our life has completely had fallen apart. This is a wonderful time to, to begin to refocus on the Lord. And, and there's, there's so much that God desires to do within our hearts and our lives. As David began to look around, there are several things I want to share with you from these verses. First, he acknowledges that he has no other God. Oh God, you are my God. There is no other it is to cry of someone who has that, that personal relationship with him. I've said many, many times, and I'll keep on repeating it because there's so much confusion today. Christianity really is all about a relationship, a relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ by putting our faith and trust in him and experiencing that spiritual birth. And that's the big question. Do you have that relationship with the Lord? Do you have a, a deep fellowship with him if you have that relationship? Because unless you've been born again into the family of God, you don't have that relationship. And once you've been born, there must be that surrender, that letting go, so that you can enjoy that constant fellowship with him. You may have a knowledge about God, but that's much different than really knowing God. Then second, he began to seek the Lord. That word seek has several meanings. Actually, the best picture, it is someone who, who is praying, someone who is spending time in fellowship with God, someone who, who has come to the place in their life where each and every day, it seems like unless I spend time in his presence, oh, I missed something. Oh, one of the greatest need today I really believe is for people to really begin to seek the Lord how important that is David said you know my life has become like a desert but I'm going to begin to seek the Lord and see what it is that he wants to do in my heart and my life and then 30 began to thirst for the Lord several years ago I went hiking up in the Smoky Mountains on a trail and it was a very long trail I don't even know if the trail is still there but it was roughly five miles to my designation and five miles back and I would be climbing about 3,000 feet and it was no problem except about three-fourths of the way up I ran out of water I did not anticipate I drank more water than what I was realizing I was drinking and I was out. I'm going to tell you, time I got back, you're talking about being thirsty? I had one go to get in my truck, go to the first store that I came to, and buy all the water I could buy. And I bought one of those big containers of water. 
And folks, I turned that thing up. It was running down my shirt. I mean, it was going everywhere, and I, I was drinking it. Why? I was parched, and I was feeling weak. This is the picture David had. He had a thirst for God. Let me ask you something. Do you have that kind of thirst for God? Do you have that kind of longing for Him? That was his greatest desire. And fourth, he began to long for the Lord. There was not a part of his life that was not desiring God. Now, that word long in the, in the Hebrew, it, it means to, to come almost to the place where he was feeling weak. He was, he was feeling faint. It was someone who had come to the end of the rope. You know, I discovered something some time back. The greatest problem, because sometimes I'd ask myself, Lord, let me back up. Why, why is our churches the way they are? Why are there not more people hungering and thirsting for the things of God? Surely, surely when we just see all the things that's happening in our nation alone, that it would create such a fresh desire and hunger and longing for the Lord. And, and, and yet it's just like it passes over. And we're seeing so many things happen, such an increase in crime and so many other things. Why, Lord? Why? What's the problem? And then the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart one day, real clear. He said, I'll tell you what the problem is. It's you. If you just get out of the way and let me have full reign. And I thought, that's what we need today. We need to get out of the way and just let him have his way in our hearts and our lives come to the end of our ropes and say, Lord, I can't, but you can, and allow him to begin to do a mighty work within us. It doesn't matter how difficult the days may be. God wants to do something that only God can do. But yet there's so many today that are, that are content, for lack of a better word, they're content with just the, the way things are. I pray I'll never be satisfied with my walk with the Lord. I, I pray I'll never come to a place to where I don't continue to seek and hunger. As Paul said in Philippians, I press on toward the high mark. In other words, I haven't arrived. And I want to tell you something, neither have you or I. We've not arrived. Sometimes you ever feel this way? You take one step forward, you take two backwards. Oh, how we need to have a fresh hunger for the things of God. Oh, how we need to come before Him, seeking Him in all things, to thirst for Him, to long for Him, to worship Him in ways that comes from our heart that we have no explanation for. Like David, we need to be moved out of our comfort zone into a life of faith. Oh, it's time to get out of the boat. Now, I know what some of you think. Yo, you're talking about the disciples and when Peter got out of the boat. Yes. Yeah, but the preacher, he sunk. Listen, he was the only one who was willing to put his faith in the Lord and get out of the boat. You know what the problem is? We want to stay in the boat. Why? It's comfortable. It's safe. I mean, we don't have to get out of our comfort zone. We don't have to extend any faith. We can just sit in the boat and ride along. But that's not where Jesus was. He was on the water. Folks, it's time to get out of the boat and start moving toward Jesus. Sometimes I'll hear somebody say, what we really need is a revival. You know what our revivals look like now? Let me tell you, I've done some of them. You have a pretty good crowd on Sunday morning because you want to try to bring in a, someone who's a real dynamic preacher. 
and, and, and hope that's going to change everything. And, and then Sunday night and Monday night and Tuesday night, you have a handful of people. I, I'm telling you, folks, this is what's going on. And then Wednesday night gets a little bit better because you have your Wednesday night crowd, but not a whole lot. And then if you have two or three that come to know Jesus, oh, we had a great revival. No, you didn't. Revival's not about people coming to know Jesus. You can't revive something that's never been alive. Revival's all about those who have a relationship with the Lord, who come alive in Jesus like they've never come alive before. And the end result is they get serious about their walk with the Lord and begin sharing the gospel, and people come to know Jesus. But it all starts with seeking Him desiring him above everything else. And then David talked about declaring God in verses 4 through 8. You know, I've, I've listened, went to a conference and listened to how hard it is to get other Christians to share about their faith. Some pastors try to use guilt. That won't work. They didn't call it that, but that's what it was. Others tried to, using a one-on-one -on -one approach, hoping that somehow that's, that's going to get people fired up. Even within our own Southern Baptist Convention, and I may sound a little condescending and critical at this point, I don't mean to. I'm thankful for everyone that came to know Jesus, but we have went through EE, Evangelism Explosion, back in the 70s before some of your time I realize that we went through master life we went through grow we've, we've done faith I mean we've done a number of things that would be short lived everybody get excited six weeks later it disappear what's going on it's not our strategy it's our heart until our hearts are lined up with his and we have a fresh hunger and desire for the Lord when that happens listen I couldn't stop you from telling someone about Jesus if I wanted to of course I wouldn't want to but I'm just telling you that's what will move us like we've never been moved before David began to experience some things as he began to seek the Lord notice one of the first things he did he began to praise the Lord I mean, I'm not talking about just simply going through the motion. I, I'm talking about genuine praise. Oh, he began to praise God for all that he did and for all that he was doing. He was praising God because something inside of him had changed. Not his circumstances, but something in his heart and his life. Sometimes our circumstances don't change, but our praise can. And we can begin to praise him and seek him in ways like we never have before. Now, here's a wonderful truth that I want to share with you that God has made known to me. When we live in a place where our hearts and our lives are surrendered to the control of the Holy Spirit of God, you're going to find yourself in a state of worship almost every single day. In conversation with God every day. I told you before, I, I'm sure there's people look at me and wonder, what's wrong with that guy? They'll look over and I've stopped at a red light and I'm over here just talking to the Lord hard as I can talk. That's all right. If it wasn't for the fact that it danger enough the way it's driving I probably just throw my hands up sometimes just say oh thank you Jesus <laughs> so you're going to have a praise that's what happened to David he began to praise God he began to lift his, his hands and, and praise in the name of God oh what a difference it makes Oh, he began to declare the Lord in ways that he never dreamed possible. And then he began to practice the presence of the Lord. Dads, let me, let me tell you something. This is so vitally important. When, when you come to that place where you have that desire and you're seeking and longing, 
the Lord. And, and, and he, your heart is lined up with his heart. One of the things that's going to begin to take place, you're going to begin to practice the presence of the Lord. I hate to say this, but I'm, I'm going to tell you something, folks. I was in a home. Had another two other people with me. There were children there. I call them children. They were 12, 13 years old. And they began to use some of the most awful language I've ever heard in all of my life. There were other things that were said and done that I can't even repeat. But I had to ask the children the question, where did this come from? And a little 12-year-old girl spoke up real fast. My mama said it was okay. They're always listening and they're always watching, Dad. They're looking to you. You can fake a lot of things. Let me tell you something. You can't fake your love for Jesus. They know if it's real. They know if it's genuine. I can always tell when someone's been in the presence of the Lord. Almost all the time. It just kind of bubbles out. <laughs> and I love it. It's there. You know that the Holy Spirit has been dealing with their hearts and their lives. I read about a wonderful experience that had taken place that well illustrates what I'm talking about. Matter of fact, there was a well-known professional golfer. True story, by the way. Back when President Gerald Ford was in office. And Billy Graham was also playing with him. The three of them were playing. And after the round was over. One of the other pros asked, well, how was it like playing with the president and Billy Graham? And he said, I don't need Billy Graham stuff and religion down my throat. And with that, he headed to the practice tee and he drove out all of his frustration on the balls. He said, was Billy a little rough out on you out there? And the pro sighed and said with embarrassment, no, he didn't even mention religion in any way. What was going on? Just the mere presence of the Lord living in him spoke to his heart. Dads, moms, others, our children are watching. They're watching. Folks, let me tell you something. I'm going to close with this. I've said it to my own family. I'm going to say it to you. You don't have to tell me. I already know. I, I'm an old man. I am. I'm, I'm 70 years old. I'm all right. God's blessed me and I've had a wonderful life. But my heart breaks in two when I think about all these precious children. What's it going to look like? What's the church going to look like when they're my age? And if that doesn't alarm you and if that doesn't concern you, there's something wrong in your life spiritually. Let's stand together. Maybe you're here today. There's never been a time when you've asked Jesus into your heart and life.
We have men that will be standing over here, our deacons. They'll be glad to pray with you. They'll be glad to help you in any way. If you'd like to join the church, just talk to one of these men. They'll help you. They'll tell you what you need to do. I'll be the first to tell you, Lone Oak is not a perfect church. For no other reason, just because of me. But I also will tell you, I've come to know many of you. <laughs> there is no perfect church. We are sinners saved by grace. But it's a good church. And we love the Lord. And we're moving forward in kingdom work. And we're giving him the glory. So we invite you, if you're looking for a church home, to come and to be a part. Or maybe dads or others, you just need to come to the altar this morning and do some business with the Lord. Maybe you feel like spiritually you're dry and parched. And today you need a, a, a renewal, a freshness of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. We invite you to come. Father, right now, this is not my invitation, it's yours. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen.
too late. Amen. Brother Jerry, you want to share with us? You may be seated. Church family, we have uh, Miss Patsy Crawford who's coming by faith. Uh, she would like to become a member of Lone Oak Baptist, and uh, we would like to welcome her, and, and God bless you, Miss Crawford. I make a motion. You got a second? Amen. Amen. And also, we have, uh, come on up, we have uh, Jesse and Kimberly Huggins. Uh, they would like to come by faith, uh, letter of faith, or but to join Lone Oak, they've been coming here for about two years, and we'd like to welcome them, and, and God bless y'all, and I'll make a motion. Motion. And welcome, y'all, y'all make them, make them feel at home. Church family, this morning, we also have this morning, my good friend, Brother John here, and Lacey have come before the church to uh, join in membership. If... Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying amen. 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 <clears throat> All right. Let me. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Y'all, I'd like to say, you know, uh, God, our God is good. He brought us Brother Mike in time of need. And I'd like to publicly thank him for the job he's done. Thank you very much. Thank you. What a joy and privilege it's been. I've come to love you and appreciate you in ways you'll never dream of. Let me ask you folks something. Are you good with people coming by and shaking your hand? I just want to make sure if you all will come in just a little bit closer to each other then. We'll form a line right over here, and I want you to be sure and come by and welcome them to Lone Oak Baptist Church. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. It's time for our life group Sunday school time. But you take the time to come by and welcome these folks. Thank you so much for being here. Happy Father's Day. Tell somebody about Jesus. <laughs> 